Once again, you've joined us for the Humanities in Class webinar titled, what are you, what you're fighting for, American women in World War II? Kara Dixon Vuick, who is a professor of history at Texas Christian University, is our speaker tonight. I'm very pleased to be joined by our TA, that is a member of our Teacher Advisory Council, Carl Gregory. Carl's down at DeSoto Central High School in South Haven, Mississippi. And Carl is going to be uh, generally chatting in the box, asking questions, keeping us connected, and we'll be developing some instructional resources that connect tonight's talk with the classroom uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, Professor, can you hear me down in Texas? Absolutely. Hey, great to hear your voice. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, Professor, as you heard me mention in, in my opening remarks, as the moderator, I'll bring you questions. But I'd like to sort of break the ice and start with a, a personal question, if you don't mind, just to show you the way this works. Um, and and I'm curious, uh, I'm curious about your memories of the first time you voted. Do you remember the first time you went into the ballot box? I do actually. Um, it I can't, it was 1992, I believe, and I went with my dad, and we voted in my elementary school, in the cafeteria. Uh, it was uh, the Clinton was running against uh, someone who I obviously didn't vote for it that year because I can't even remember <laughs> now. <laughs> But I That's do right. remember voting for the first time, yeah. And such a, um, a a nice, not just metaphor, but literal visual of you voting in your elementary school. And, you know, obviously yeah. the question yeah. is connected to today and Election Day. It's connected to kind of what's on all of our minds. But it also seems, it strikes me that it speaks pretty directly to the, uh, to the hypothetical that you posed in the title tonight, what you're fighting for. Um, and and I'm, I'm curious, um, as we move forward, through tonight as we bring those things forward, how we can keep that in mind, even if it's not explicit in the ways that we're supporting democracy here in, in the United States. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you for sharing uh, uh, your first voting. I hope you got a sticker and uh, gave your teacher a <laughs> thumbs up when you walked by our room. Um, we're looking forward to the talk um, and I'll bring you questions as, as we move forward. All right, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, Lee Holder, I feel old as well. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so thank you everybody for coming. It seems from the looks of it here that half of the Los Angeles School District is on this um, webinar. So I really appreciate it. Uh, and especially to, the, to my friend in Fort Worth who is here tonight. Um, what I wanna do actually is start with um, a little bit about who I, or why I came to TCU. Um, you know, I have a very long title here, the Lance Corporal Benjamin W. Schmidt Professor of War, Conflict, and Society in 20th Century America. Um, and I came to TCU for this position that was created in memory of a TCU student who um, came to TCU and had himself a very, um, very, very good time. <laughs> Um, he had that good time outside of classrooms, and after about three semesters, his family um, told him that they weren't going to support this um, this fun time he was having, we'll say, any longer. And he uh, went back home. He was from San Antonio. Um, he went back home to San Antonio, Texas, and he came home one day and surprised his family by telling them that he had joined the Marine Corps. Um, he was not a member of a you know prior service family, kind of took the family by surprise. Um, but he became a Marine, he became a scout sniper, and he deployed twice to Afghanistan. And on that second tour, he was killed in a friendly fire accident. Um, and before he left, he had told his family um, that what he wanted to do was to finish out his enlistment come back to TCU, finish his history degree, and then go on and become a professor and teach military history. And when he died, um, he, his family discovered that he had left half of his life insurance policy to the TCU History Department. And so our top graduate student award is named in his memory and gives the student a year to work on their dissertation with no other obligations. Um, and that was, that was a gift from a 24-year-old knucklehead student. Um, in all honesty, he was he was a knucklehead. Um, I'm kind of smiling. You can't see that, but I'm smiling because, um, you know, we we all know students like that. And he he gave a very generous gift that inspired his family then to create a professorship here at TCU um, for someone who studies war, conflict, and society. Um, one of the things we get to do is to hold a annual symposium on those themes, and at the 
the very first um, symposium we had, his dad got up. He asked me if he could say something at the end, and I had no idea what he was going to say. Um, and he got up at the end, and he said he knows the cost of war, and he wants other people to think about that cost as well. And so what I hope we can do tonight is to talk about a cost of war that few likely consider when we think about war's costs. Um, we'll think about the cost for women, particularly American women um, who went to war zones around the globe during World War II to entertain and comfort U.S. servicemen. Um, and the talk comes from my latest book, The Girls Next Door, um, which is about women and military entertainment from World War I through the war in Afghanistan. Um, and so it broadly comes from that book. But what I'd like to do first um, is to kind of set a broad context for what's happening in women's lives during World War II, and of how the nation understood women's place in the war effort, um, and I think if you mention women in World War II to most people, what they think of are women who joined the military or women who worked in unconventional roles um, during the war, right? And that's, that's a well-told story, um, perhaps not as well as or as often as we might like, um, but wartime mobilization brought women into more public roles than they had held um, across the board before the war new roles in the military, um, new roles in the workforce. It brought new groups of women into the workforce. Um, if your screen is large enough, you can actually see on this photograph that someone has inked in an arrow pointing to the wedding band on the woman's hand on the right. And I, I think what the intent was in doing that was to point out that she is a married woman. Um, she is one of the new groups of women brought into the workforce um, in large numbers. And a lot of women jumped at the opportunity in World War II to, for, these, for these new, role, new roles. Um, it brought better work, better pay, more security. It was a chance to contribute to the war effort. But all of this also brought changes that a lot of American society um, did not, was not so comfortable with, right? It led to women moving away from home moving away from the supervision of their family, um, more economic freedom, right? All of these things um, were big cultural changes and not everybody was ready for it. And so if you think about some of the images uh, that we've seen of women in World War II, particularly sort of propaganda posters um, that come out of the government, these are all responding to wartime demands for women to take on new work. Right? They're trying to encourage women to get into the workforce or to join the military. They're convincing the public that this is important work, it's necessary work, it's patriotic work, um, that this work is not going to um, alter, you know, affect these women in horrible ways. Right? These are women who are very feminine in appearance. They're very professional looking. Um, and so I think a lot of the images that we see of women in World War II are ways that the public came to rationalize, to reconcile, to understand women's new roles during the war. And so today what I want to focus on are women in the Red Cross um, who, and women in the USO who fit into these stories. And to think about women whose jobs in the war were to serve coffee and donuts. Um, women whose job it was to perform on stage, right? Quite literally, many of these women are the sideshow to the war. Um, but what I want to think about is how these women's helped serve a much broader purpose in the war and what that meaning was for Americans, what the, the meaning of women's work was, but also what it cost the women themselves. And so what we'll do is we'll start with a clip um, which Andy will show us. And that, to give you a little bit of context, this is the Bob Hope Show. Um, this is um, Bob Hope introducing Patty Thomas, who was a dancer and singer, um, just kind of starting out when she was selected by Hope for the tour. And in this video clip, they are on tour. Um, they're going from Hawaii to the South Pacific um, in 1944, 1945. Um, and this is just a short little clip that will introduce uh, a lot of the themes from tonight. So, Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Kara. And let me remind the audience that at this point, I'm going to launch a video. What this will do is pop up on your screen, uh, almost like a separate window, 
the old uh, pop-up uh, webinar style, and you will be able to hear the volume through that, but make sure your volume is up. And if for some reason it doesn't attach, the, the volume isn't there, the, the audio isn't there, be patient with us, and we'll make sure that you have uh, access, access to this at the conclusion. So, Kara, I'm going to go ahead and launch this, and uh, it looks Sounds like it's a little, just a shade under three minutes, and then at the conclusion, we'll stop it and we'll talk some more. In jungle centers or wherever there's GI life, there's hope, and we do mean Bob. The man with the shovel nose who has traveled over 80,000 miles to keep soldiers happy in highlights of his latest South Pacific tour. And something new as Signal Corps cameras catch the master in a dancing mood. Francis Langford. Thanks for the memory. You walk up Sammy's crew. A minute far too few. I wish that I could kiss each and every one of you. So you want to get us trampled to death for you kid? Just finished working with Crosby and Lamour in a picture, The Road to Utopia. I think it's the last of the roads. We're going to work on the detours next. You all know Crosby, Sinatra's father. But I want to tell you... Nah, he's all right, that Sinatra. He's 4F, you know. He's got a punctured eardrum from listening to Bing's records. He really has. But he's a nice boy. And the Wax just voted in their pinup boy. They gotta pin him up or he'll fall down. Hope displays another member of his company, Patty Thomas, a welcome sight on any battlefront. I just want you boys to see what you're fighting for, that's all. Patty, we're gonna do a little, a little scene for you now, ladies and gentlemen, you might enjoy it. It's a little scene in the set in Central Park shows a boy and a girl walking through the park. I play the part of the boy. <laughs> well, some night. Some night. Some park. Some park. Some moon. Some moon. Some bench. Some bench. Some grass. Some grass. Some dew. I don't. <laughs> I hope the next time we see you, right in your neighborhood theater. Good luck. God bless you. Goodbye. There you go. All right. I had to explain who Bob Hope was to some students a few years ago, and it was really unnerving. Because I'm like, how do we not know who Bob Hope is anymore? Um, it's also kind of hard to explain who Bob Hope was. Um, they, they don't have the equivalent um, anymore, it seems. But anyway... Um, I love that clip of of Bob Hope, sort of with Patty Langford and, and or Francis Langford, Patty Thomas, um, and especially the joke, right, with with Patty Thomas that you know I don't. Um, and so, what does he mean when he says that he wants the boys, right? And I think it's important to note that they're boys when he says this. They're boys. What he what does he mean when he says he wants the boys to see what they're fighting for? Right now, World War II is sort of um, it's steeped in a lot of nostalgia when we think about sort of the popular uh, memory of World War II. But if you look back to the war years, very few Americans could explain with any real depth what the war was about. Right. They knew Hitler needed to be stopped. They knew the United States had been attacked, but their understanding of the war wasn't much deeper than that. And so the U.S. government provided reasons. Um, you know, after learning that most soldiers couldn't explain the war's causes, the government gave them some reasons, right? The Four Freedoms, Norman Rockwell's posters, right? All of that is part of this. But in large part, the war gets explained to Americans as 
a private obligation, right? It's something that individuals owe. Um, it's characterized, you know, if you did the Robert or got to see the Robert West book um, reading, it's characterized as a private obligation to your family, to your children, to your parents, um, to the American way of life, consumerism, and it, and also women. Um, women are cast as something that needs to be protected. Um, and uh, of course, all of this is um, steeped in uh, a lot of racist characterizations of the Japanese, um, but women as something to be protected, right? You need to protect your women from abuse, from potential rape. Um, and as part of that part of that negotiation, women are then told to be something worth protecting, um, to be an ideal worth fighting for. Um, and so women are cast as something that men can look forward to returning to. Um, a lot of those images are also connected to um, capitalism, to free enterprise. Um, you know, women are tied to the home, to domesticity. Um, women are the reward for making it home. Um, you know, and for many people, especially um, folks who had been very poor during the Great Depression, World War II is really an era when Americans are doing pretty well, um, particularly compared to the rest of the world. American quality of life was improving. They were better fed. Um, and capitalism is central to these ads, right? Capitalism is essential to the American way of life, to domesticity, the fruits of victory. Um, and if you think about women as the reward, I mean, if you think historically of women as the bounty of war, um, that's a long-standing characterization of women. Um, and so while the reward might be domesticity, it is also about sex and it's about women's bodies. Um, and we see this sexualized use of women's bodies in official ways. Um, we see it in government, we see government endorsement of this. We see it in military publications through pinups. Um, here you've got um, Yank, which was a weekly army magazine. You see it, um, you sort of see women's bodies in a sort of very famous Betty Grable pinup um, here, but Betty Grable, another image of her um, in a in a GI issue um, shirt, you know, with no pants, of course, here, um, and that being used to teach map reading. Um, and so you see sort of women's bodies used in these official ways. You also see it, um, women cast in a in a kind of nostalgic way. Um, as in this photograph where you have the GI sort of wistfully longing for um, the many girls he has at home, apparently. <laughs> he seems to have lots of them. Um, I think it's important to note too, in this photograph, um, race is key here. Um, you very rarely see the kind of sexualized images of black women used in official ways that you do of white women. Um, African-American women had far less um, room for maneuvering given the historical sexualization of black women. Um, and so there are all kinds of ways you see this. Um, you see it in the Esquire case um, of Esquire magazine, which very famously featured um, what was then known as the Varga girls, um, this, this kind of depiction of women, um, which were drawn by a Peruvian artist. Um, the army asked Esquire magazine to provide copies and the magazine very happily was going to oblige Till the postal service tried to revoke mailing privileges um, because they said these were lewd images. Ultimately, the Supreme Court um, ruling said that it was permissible to mail these images through the mail uh, because of men's morale, because they boosted men's morale, right? I mean, you can't forget as well, nudes on airplanes um, being, right? remember these airplanes are government property. Uh, where did they get the paint? Where did they get the time? Um, all of these kinds of official ways in which women's bodies are used. Um, and I think this is why the use of Patty Thomas in that clip is so important, right? That she is being dangled in front of the men as reward, right? But the joke is absolutely essential, right? She can walk th through the park with Bob Hope. Um, she can be a symbol of romantic walks in the park, but it mattered in the end that she said, I don't, right? She had to be the good girl from home that few at the time thought of what it cost her to play that part, right? Thomas was, um, 
I, I think to say she was naive was not is not an overstretch. Um, when she started this work um, with the USO and with the Bob Hope Show, she thought that they were there to see her dance. Um, she was a tap dancer, and she said later in an interview that the first time she saw the crowd of men, that she was worried they wouldn't be able to hear the her shoes tapping during the dance. Uh, she said, "I thought everyone loved tap dancing, but that's not exactly what it was." It's a kid that's 21 years old, and she has a 34, 24, 34 figure and long legs, and that's not exactly what they were there to do, to hear my tap, right? She quickly came to realize that she was, she was not a tap dancer um, to these men. That was just part of the show. Um, but Patty Thomas was just one of thousands of good girls from home um, who entertained soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines during the war. And if we think about Red Cross and USO women, we probably think of famous women like Marlene Dietrich, right, who went on USO shows and who stole the headlines. But it was far more common to see women who most of these men had never heard of before, women like Patty Thomas, women like these USO dancers, um, whose names we don't even know today. Um, it was even more common for GIs to see um, Red Cross women. Right, women who um, were working in Red Cross clubs for soldiers and sailors around the world, or who were driving club mobiles around the field, taking donuts and coffee uh, to, to troops in the field who could not get to base where the, where the clubs were. But why are these women there in the first place? Right, why did they have to be good girls? And to understand that, we're gonna to have to look a, back a little bit to World War I, and so that's where we'll go next. Um, but I wanted to take a little pause here and see who has questions um, and what, what you might wanna ask right now. Yeah, fantastic. And I wanna remind everyone in the audience that there is an Ask the Professor tab in your lower left-hand corner of your screen. Please do submit any formal questions that you have, um, and I'll bring this forward to uh, to Dr. Vuelich. First one comes from Jennifer. Jen, uh, she's in Fort Lauderdale. She wonders about the compensation for uh, both men and women to do these USO tours during World War II. Um, was Bob Hope paid? Was uh, uh, Were the other women paid? And if so, how much? Right, that's a great question. Um, so folks like Bob Hope or Marlene Dietrich typically volunteered their services during the war. Um, they might have had their expenses paid. Um, uh, Bob Hope's show is, is sort of a special case in that he's got a whole traveling show. But generally, those are the folks we think of. Um, and as far as I can tell, it's, I mean, count on one hand, the percentage of folks who are famous in the USO who are traveling, the vast majority are these women who want to get into the entertainment business you know, who want to be singers, who want to be dancers, that kind of thing. And they are paid basically the industry rates, um, sort of industry rates for actors um, who might be in New York. That's essentially the level. It's not, um, it's not, you know, it's not enough to make a living on, but it's enough to get you through the war. Uh, your transportation's paid, you know, the military's generally providing you with a billet, with housing, that kind of thing. So you would make a little bit of money, but not great money. Same for the Red mm. Cross. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, this question comes from Kurt. Kurt is in New Jersey and wonders how, if you can speak a little bit to the collision or the tension between um, what you've shared so far about the ways that women were used to portray the prize, the you know, the allure, the, uh, the, the sort of the flirtation of, of what we're, they were fighting for with uh, with concepts of marriage, thinking that at least some, some percentage of the troops were married men. How, how did that uh, affect, how, how did those two concepts collide? That is a really good question. Um, and in fact, some of the women were also married. We'll kind of get to that in, a, in just a second with the Red Cross. Um, I mean, the idea here is is very complex, right? They're, they're holding up these women as lures as prizes um, and that's a fine a very very fine line between that and sort of presenting them as wholesome kind of symbols of the home and family 
of romantic relationships, um, there's a real fine line between that and between um, overt sexualization of these women. And so, you know, for young men who are coming to a Red Cross club or a USO show, they might see one thing in these women. A married man missing his wife and kids at home might see something different. Um, and so part, in part, the answer I think is in um, how these women are, are viewed by the men they're working for and working with. Um, but it is a very, very fine line. And the women themselves are the ones who have to figure out where, you know, which side of the line they're on at which time. They're the ones who have to figure out what does this man who just came into the Red Cross need? Does he need someone who reminds him of his sister or someone who reminds him of his sweetheart? Um, and how, you know, where is that line? Um, some of the examples we'll get to are about these women trying to negotiate that. Um, but it is a really good question um, and sort of hits hints at and gets to the fundamental um, problem for the women in these programs. Yes, thank you. Uh, this question comes from Lance. Lance is in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and wonders if women were used in a similar way during the recruitment phase. You've shared ideas of once troops are deployed, but what about just trying to get kids to sign up? I know there was a draft, but still, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's World War II or later, uh, were they used in the recruitment ploy? Um, not so much, not so much. It's really once they're in, um, once they are at training camps and being sort of moved around the United States, um, the USO is opening clubs on the home front to give them something to do. And then what we're going to focus on is what happens abroad um, in the war zones. You know, it, now that someone's asked it, I wonder why they didn't think of that. Um, <laughs> you know. Why nobody, right. why nobody thought of that, but, um, but that's a good question. They really didn't. It was more once you get in, um, then they'll, they'll work with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, to extend the, that thought a little bit, I wonder if the reels and the film and the, uh, the trailers, like the ones that you shared tonight that may play uh -huh. in movie theaters mm -hmm. or may be offered in some way, I wonder if that's kind of an implicit recruitment tool. Yeah, sort of an unintended consequence, even or or something yeah. that, um, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, why don't we move forward? I've got some more questions that are stacking up. I see them all. Thank you for submitting them, but I think they might come better a little later. So, Professor, why don't we move forward, and I'll bring some more to you shortly. Sure. Yeah. Um, I see one of the questions from Carl actually is sort of the, a great segue about why why there's so much sexualization in World War II and not really during World War I. Um, I mean, I think most Americans today think of the military as an honorable institution or something that if your child joined the services, you know, that's something you're proud of. Um, before World War I, that wasn't really the case. Right. Enlisted soldiers were generally thought of as these hard scrabble men who did dirty and dangerous work. They're mostly out on the frontier in the West. Um, and most Americans just really didn't think much about the work that they did or the notorious conditions that surrounded military camps. If they did, they most likely thought, well, these guys are out there. It's just this horrible life. They're doing the nation's dirty work. Um, they're entitled to a little bit of fun. Um, officers were thought of differently, but this is generally how most people thought of enlisted soldiers. But as you're approaching U.S. entry into World War I, right, we're in the middle of the progressive era, and a lot of social welfare organizations started to get very concerned uh, as it looked likely that the U.S. would enter the Great War. Um, and so on the eve of American entry, Selective service conscripts a cross section of the nation's men. Now, all of a sudden, a, a huge swath of the country is very concerned about the kinds of influences that are going to surround their sons, right? In particular, Americans feared that military service would introduce their sons to prostitution and to alcohol. And of course, they're about to be sent to France. And, you know, that just kind of blew the thing out of the water for most Americans, given what they thought of France in general. Um, Americans also were generally skeptical of a standing military and of conscription, 
And so the government had a lot of work to do to convince the public that military service would be good for their sons. And to do that, military and government officials started to advance this idea that military service would make their sons better men. And they did that by coordinating with civilian organizations like the YMCA, the YWCA, um, the Jewish Welfare Board, National Catholic Community Service. Um, all of these organizations coordinate to provide educational programs, to build recreation centers, provide religious services for men, um, to create what they start to call as home, a home away from home, right? And you'll see this in this World War I advertisement for YMCA huts. Um, the key to all of this is women, right? Um, progressive era reformers, military officials, all argued that the, be the best safeguard against lonely doughboys soliciting prostitutes was to send what they called the right kind of women to remind them of their mothers, their sisters, and their sweethearts, and to inspire them to sexual abstinence. Um, one official said, men must be furnished with healthful amusement or they will turn to the first petticoat they see. Um, and so during World War I, the YMCA and the Salvation Army together sent about 3,500 women to Europe where they opened huts and canteens um, and in theory are to distract the men from the vices that awaited them all over France, right? Um, they mirror progressive era notions of race and class in that all but three one, two, three, three of these women were white and most of them were middle and upper class. All right, now it's a very optimistic idea, right? I mean, I'm sure most of us hearing this today think what in the world were they thinking? Uh, you know, just send some middle-class white girls from home and it'll all be fine. Uh, and it doesn't quite work out the way that they thought it might. Um, but when the United States began mobilizing for another world war two decades later, Military officials um, demanded from the government that civilian women provide recreation for military personnel, right? And so by World War II, they're far more pragmatic about um, sexuality. Um, and there's, there's not the same kind of progressive era optimism that providing women and sending women to serve donuts would keep men out of trouble. Um, but they do believe that civilian women are essential. Um, FDR actually insisted himself against some pushback from the military, um, that men, military men had to be surrounded by civilian influences, especially during war and during long deployments. And remember, of course, in 1942, when a lot of this is really getting off the ground, um, nobody knows how long these deployments are gonna be. And so there was a lot of concern that men would become too militarized, right? And so the women, the civilian women who are sent to all of these war zones are there to give the men something to fight for, to bolster their sense of manhood, um, but not too much. Of course, that's a, another fine line. Um, and to maintain a kind of a sense of normal domestic relationships partly so that the men will be around women and will be easier integrated back into civilian society at the war's end, right? And so USO women, Red Cross women, this is the goal, right? This is the goal in World War II. This is why they are going all over the world, um, bringing donuts and coffee. It's not about the donuts. It's not about the coffee. It's about these larger ideals. Um, and so, they want to keep these men from becoming too militarized. And where you see that concern is particularly in non-Western theaters, right? The farther they get from Europe, um, the more these concerns become pronounced in military discourse. Um, I love this political cartoon from the, from the time. Um, it's got two USO performers in a caged box being taken um, to some military post and says, I, want, I understand we'll be the first women they've seen in over a year. And I love this one because it's, you know, you wonder who is the danger, right? Is it the women? Are they in a cage because they are dangerous or are they being protected from the men um, by putting them in the cage, right? It's also interesting 
because not, it's not true that none of these men have, seen, have not seen women in over a year. What's true, perhaps, is that they haven't seen white women in over a year. And so there's an underlying sort of implicit racial, um, racial component to all of this um, in terms of the Western, non-Western theaters and, and what the concern is. Um, an Army Air Force general at an isolated post in Burma said in 1945 that the presence of women in these faraway outposts made the difference for the servicemen between savagery and civilization, right? These programs, um, I've kind of, no, I'm trying not to look at the audience chat, but I, I noticed earlier some questions about what might be the case today. Um, these programs continued in Korea and in the Vietnam eras. Um, where American women are still used as symbols of a supportive home front, um, particularly in the Vietnam War, um, sort of this protracted conflict. Um, and in the 60s, they're used to, to represent a conventional brand of American femininity in contrast to the work of Korean Vietnamese women um, who were working as soldiers, um, as prostitutes, or as laborers on U.S. military bases. Um, again, most of these are unknown women that we wouldn't know today, um, college graduates in the Red Cross in particular. Um, after the Vietnam War, these programs shift a little bit with the ending of conscription, the beginnings of the volunteer force. Um, a lot of the USO programs start to focus on families, right? Elmo goes on USO tour um, to support military families and children. There's a lot of attention to helping families settle in um, South Korea and Germany on bases. Um, but even today, we have still got traces of sort of showcasing women's bodies as entertainment. Um, the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders are, are the most infamous example of that. Um, they've been on tours since 1979. Um, and so you still got elements of this, even though today's military is a much more diverse force, includes far more women than it did um, in earlier years. And so we've got traces of these kinds of programs, um, even though it's, um, things have changed as well. Um, but in some ways, these programs seem rather innocuous, right? They seem almost perfect symbols of the mom and apple pie kind of image of the country that Americans really wanted during World War II. Um, I love this photograph. I just wish it were apple pie instead of watermelon. <laughs> it would be even better. Um, you know, on the surface of it, serving donuts, jitterbugging with war-weary GIs. It asks women to do what they have often done in wartime, right? They're there to boost morale. They symbolize a supportive home front. Um, they provide a semblance of domestic relationships in what was then a mostly male military. And that's a very reassuring image for families who are worried about what war or being away from home might do to their sons, their husbands, their boyfriends, right? These images are crucial to the ways that the military mobilized public support and rationalized the drafts to a skeptical public. Um, but I think that they're also more than just um, reassuring images to the American public, right? It's a tangible way in which the military managed long-term deployments the stresses of combat, deployments to non-Western environments, um, and all of these women were volunteers, every single one of them. They all volunteered to go to war zones to offer this small respite from the war. Um, they did offer a home away from home, right? But their work is also far more complicated, I think, than the images would allow. Um, the military, tried to negate the cost of war for men by deploying women to war zones, but it never thought about what it might cost the women that it sent, right? So if we think about what entertainment required of women, right, they're unofficial counselors, right? Commanders frequently asked for women to come to support their units after they had, had been through hard battles or had lost members of their unit. And that is not easy work. And it's not work that the women were trained for, right? They're trained to entertain. They are not trained to be grief counselors, but they were used in that way because they were women, right? The training women got told them to wear perfume, to put ribbons in their hair. 
Um, it coached them in how to engage men in conversation. Um, sometimes official duties involved staging fashion shows or going on dates with GIs. And for most of the 20th century, that reverses what women were expected to do, right? It reverses courtship conventions in which women are not to be, not to make the first move. They're not to initiate conversation with strangers. They're not to flirt or be friendly with men who come from very different backgrounds than their own, that all of this work in the war demanded that they do that. Um, it's also important, and this is kind of what we were talking about a little bit before with the questions, that all of this work is very carefully couched and presented to the public in a language of respectability, right? And women are expressly forbidden from engaging in any activity that even hinted at anything resembling immorality, right? Don't even go near that line. But they're being held up as alternatives to prostitution, as something to be desired, and they do all of this work in the middle of a war zone, right? Many of these women are one of a handful of women in seas of men. They are surrounded by men. And sometimes these women end up in situations that they have to maneuver, right? They have to figure out how to, how to protect themselves in all kinds of ways, right? So if we look at the work that the women did, um, well, what I wanna do is look at three different women um, and sort of take us through take us through all of this. Um, I think they're all three great examples of different issues um, that some of these women face. Um, now, today, the military does a lot of this work on its own. Um, if you've been in the military, some of this work is very similar to MWR, to morale, welfare, recreation work. Um, but in World War II, again, this is the Red Cross that provides most of this, uh, most of this work. There were a thousand Red Cross clubs in every theater from Scotland to Nigeria, to China to Australia, India. They were everywhere GIs went. Um, there were about 6,000 women who went abroad to these clubs. Um, they organized dances, parties, games. They served food. They spent a lot of time just listening to GIs. Um, and that was all on clubs from, or on bases and nearby military bases. For those who were out in the field, the Red Cross started what it called the Club Mobile Program. Uh, and they took London buses, two and a half ton military trucks, they gutted them, and they equipped these trucks with donut making machines and coffee makers. Um, and they, these women learned to drive these trucks. They had to take care of them on their own. Um, they had to drive them in military convoys with trailers. They had to change the oil and the tires, fix the engines. They did all of this work and they followed the troops um, wherever they were going to bring all of this to the troops. Um, they carried newspapers from home, phonograph machines, they were playing music. Um, and so everywhere they went, GIs knew they were coming. Um, but daily life on this club mobile circuit was, not, was no picnic, right? Um, the, our, the first of our women here is Gretchen Schuyler, um, and she was an accomplished athlete. Um, she was the daughter of a World War I colonel. Um, she went to Boston University and excelled at nine sports while there. Um, so she was, she was no, she was not, um, yeah, she was not unprepared for a hard life. Um, she was a member of the first U.S. women's lacrosse team. Um, and she joined the Red Cross in January of 43. But even for Gretchen, this life was pretty rough. Um, she wrote a letter to her father and described a typical day. Um, she said she was on the club mobile by 5.30 in the morning to knead by hand 120 pounds of flour to make the donuts. Um, she and a colleague then cooked and stacked donuts until two. They took them out to a military camp, served the donuts, arrived back at the post by five to clean the club mobile and its supplies before dinner at 6.30. Right. She said she went to bed with the birds, but decided that this life agrees with me. Um, apparently, the Red Cross thought she was doing a pretty good job because it promoted her to supervise a convoy of club mobiles that was scheduled to follow the American invasion in France. 
Um, she organized the ships, uh, loading, or loading the clubmobiles onto ships. They sailed across the channel, and they were the first clubmobiles um, to drive ashore on Utah Beach on July 16th, so about five and a half weeks after the Allied invasion of France. Um, while following the first army as it moved through France, Gretchen drove her Jeep, which she had named the Fetching Gretchen. If you can see in the photograph, it kind of cuts off the first part of Fetching, um, but that's her Jeep. Um, and she took supplies and mail to the women who worked the club mobiles. She coordinated schedules with the military. And all of the women who were doing this work endured the trying conditions of life on the move. They slept in tents, they ate field rations, they bathed in their helmets, they dug their latrines. And for women who had been enlisted in this work to serve as reminders of the femininity of American woman um, and womanhood, clubmobile life in many ways seemed to contradict the image that they were meant to project, right? Most Red Cross women who worked in clubs wore suits, hats, gloves, skirts, Clubmobile women wore trousers and jackets or coveralls, boots and helmets. And remember how, how unusual it would have been for women of the middle classes to wear trousers in this era. Um, so for these women, this is, this is a bit of a novelty. Um, Gretchen described her colleagues as the least frilly of all the Red Cross women. Um, she said, I've never in my life been more dirty, more tired, and yet more happy. Um, she wrote to her family about how fulfilled she was by this work and how much um, she enjoyed it, even though it was very, very difficult. Um, women like Gretchen embraced the harshness of this work um, and their living conditions as a sign that they were really in it, right? That they were really in the war, um, doing as much as they could for the war effort. Um, they really took great pride in what they called their battle dress uniform. Um, that they thought it symbolized sort of their common experiences with the GIs. Um, she said, this is, Gretchen wrote, this is the nearest anyone could ever be and still not be a GI, right? Of course, Red Cross women were not to be anything like GIs, <laughs> um, not at all. Um, the American public was still not quite sure what it thought of women soldiers, in fact. Um, but as Gretchen's experiences tell us, their work demanded far more of them than that they just be a pretty face. Um, and so I will take another pause here and see um, where we are on the questions um, and what you might think of Gretchen's experiences. Great, thank you. And uh, one more time, I'll remind the audience here, uh, now that we're about two thirds of the way through tonight's webinar, you can ask the professor tab uh, to submit formal questions. First question I'm gonna to bring to you, uh, uh, Professor, is from Jancy in Clark County, Nevada. Um, uh, he or she, they, uh, Jancy is interested in how women generally were recruited for this work. Um, did they apply? Were they, um, were they drafted? Were they sought? Were the, was there advertisements? How, how did these women come to the positions? Um, a lot of the recruitment was done on college campuses. Um, the Red Cross thought that women who were in college were sort of the right, right blend of qualities that they want, uh, that they wanted. And so women had to apply, they had to have references. Um, a lot of the women interviewed locally. Um, African American women all had to travel to Washington, DC to go to the Red Cross headquarters for interviews. Um, so there was a, a substantial difference in how African American women and white women were recruited. Um, but they all went through an interview process submitted references, that kind of thing, um, to sort of substantiate their character, um, that they were they were the right kind of women for this work. Mm, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna combine several questions for uh, for the next mm -hmm. one. This will be a composite question. This comes from okay. uh, Susie and Rita and Allison. Um, talk to us some about, um, about the repercussions of this very delicate line that you've been walking us down. Specifically from Allison, uh, she asks, were there cases that became known of women who were sexually assaulted or who crossed that line of immorality in quotation marks in their roles on bases or in the field and uh, women whose experiences did not conform to the images and the roles promoted? Um, Samrita and Susie were also interested in uh, uh, sexual assault in the ways that the, the government, the military handled 
handle that fine line because it's not just keeping the women on the fine line. It's keeping the troops, uh, the men, Mm -hmm. you know, respecting that same line. So talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, that in the whole book, not just, I mean, if the book that deal, you know, dealing with World War One and even through more modern times, that was the hardest thing for me to find explicit conversations about sexual harassment. Um, what you see in World War Two are women um, being sent, you know, if a woman got pregnant, she was sent home immediately, um, even if she was married. Um, there were women who were married um, who got pregnant and were sent home. Um, it was somewhat surprising to me that um, the Red Cross was did not adopt the kind of moralistic, like condemnation language I expected. Um, there was some understanding that these were women who were in a horrible situation and things happen and, you know, they were pregnant and we're going to take care of them until they have the babies and try to get them on their feet and back into life at home. With sexual harassment, that's a harder thing to find explicit discussions about um, in any era. What I did find were instances in which, um, for example, there was an instance in, in which um, a GI punched a woman. Um, she kept He kept wanting uh, her to go out on a date with him, and she refused and kept refusing, and he punched her in the face, and she went to her supervisors, and her supervisors said, it's just not the right time to bring this to the Army. Um, because from their supervisor's perspective, they were in a situation where they needed the military to help them with transportation and food and all of those sorts of things. Um, And so for the women, a a lot of them, when they do talk about it, they felt that they had no recourse um, or that, you know, that it was something that they, they had to handle on their own. Um, and so we'll see, you, what you see is that a lot of the women develop ways to kind of keep men at arm's length. Um, we'll see this particularly in one of the women um, that I'll talk about in a second, that she's really trying to be careful about who she is around um, when she is off duty um, as a way to protect herself. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a very difficult kind of thing to find. It's it's not something that you see, especially in World War One or World War Two, women overtly talking about in that era. Um, it just wasn't something, um, you know, that women would have talked about at that time openly, I think. Right. Thank you. Uh, one more question before we move to the last half an hour of our webinar. This comes from Joel. Uh, to extend now these last several questions, uh, what was the attrition given the emotional and physical concerns um, if women went through this kind of uh, stress, how many of them left early? How many of them didn't return when asked? Yeah, that's that's also a good question. Um, the Red Cross knew that this was very difficult work for the women. Um, and if they heard that there were sort of women who were having a hard time, they would send them on leave, essentially, kind of give them a break, give them a vacation. Um, but they knew that it was very difficult. Um, and but they're also they don't have enough women to go around as it is. And so, again, that's another kind of balance that the, from an organizational standpoint that the Red Cross is trying to balance, that they want more women, but they can't push them to their limits um, without some repercussions. Um, for a lot of the women, you know, they're not bound by any contract in the sense that, you know, the, you know, the ser- servicemen are there for the war's duration plus six months. The women have none of that. Um, and so you know, they could leave when they wanted, um, and some did, but, um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. It's something that Red Cross tried to manage, but not, um, not great, we'll say. Mm. (laughs) Thank thank you. Um, Kara, we have about 25 minutes left. Why don't we go through the last section of your talk, and then we'll save some questions to the end. Yeah, great. So I have two women I want to talk about um, in different theaters. Hazel Bowman um, was uh, from Plant City, Florida, sort of east of Tampa, and studied at Florida State College for Women, um, at Florida State before it came, when it was just a women's college. Um, she was very involved in her campus. She was the editor of her newspaper, of the college newspaper, um, graduated in 1937, um, and eventually, um, after a few fits and starts, um, was teaching English and band in a high school. 
After the U.S. entered World War II, she joined the Army Signal Corps, but what Hazel really wanted was to go overseas. And in a, what seems to me now a weird irony, if you really wanted to go overseas as a woman, the only way to guarantee that was to join the Red Cross. Um, Hazel was in the military and she did not have a guaranteed assignment overseas. And so she left the military, turned to the Red Cross um, and went to India in 1943, November 1943. Um, she was 26 when she left and she stayed in India and Burma until after the war ended and then came home in December of 45. Um, as an adventurous young woman um, who really wanted to serve in her mid twenties, um, Hazel was exactly what the Red Cross wanted, right? She was healthy, she was college educated, um, she was independent. Um, the Red Cross described the average Red Cross woman um, as 28, blue eyed brunette, average height and build. She spoke some French, played a little piano, taught school before the war. That was the way they characterized um, the Red Cross woman. The vast majority of them are single. Again, you could be married, but if not if you had children. Um, and again, the vast majority of them are white. Um, in the World War II, the Red Cross said that it would not segregate its clubs, but it did exactly that. Um, Hazel was also an ideal candidate because she's attractive, but she's not too attractive, right? The Red Cross wants women who will remind the GIs of women from home. Um, it did not want women solely because they were attractive, um, and indeed, some Red Cross officials thought that if women were too glamorous, they wouldn't be tough enough to, to live through a war. Um, so again, another kind of balance that, that the organization is trying to hold. Um, it wanted women who were pretty but not seductive, right? beautiful but not lewd. Um, it needed women who could symbolize the girl next door, but not be overwhelmed by all of the attention that they would receive. Um, one official said the women had to be able to appeal to the men, but also resist the temptations of being courted and pursued nightly by thousands of eager sex starved men. Um, and that, again, is the crux of the problem that everybody here has figured out from the very beginning. That is the problem um, that these women face. And it's one that Hazel discovered pretty quickly. Right. Soon after she got to India, she wrote that the women were so popular here that one could have dates with everything from the rank to the file and most any service or nationality. All of us have to pinch ourselves to remember that back home, it's one man to every eight women. And the fellows keep insisting that we have beauty, poise, et cetera, et cetera, until I'm sure I'll eventually begin to believe it. I never figured myself for such popularity, but it's very nice for a change, right? For a change. Um, Hazel did not, get the kind of attention at home that she got in India. And initially that was great. Um, men came from miles away to visit the club. She loved hearing their stories, looking at their photographs, hearing about their romances. Um, but soon enough, that constant stream of attention began to wear on her. She wrote in a letter that it's nothing to put in 13 hours a day at working and socializing. She worked long hours preparing food, planning activities, and tending to the needs of the men who came to the club in the day, and then attending dances in the evenings. And she wrote that the men can't understand why, when we've seen them in the club from 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m., that we don't want to spend 9.30 p.m. to 1 a.m. with them also. Uh, pretty ticklish business sometimes, she said. Um, and she used a phrase that went, countless other women in World War II and even other wars um, used. And she, in the, she said she lived in a goldfish bowl, right? She never had the opportunity to escape the attentions of the men that she was there to serve. And again, that's a careful balance to strike. Um, and I, this is a cartoon that was in a Clubmobile um, publication. And you can kind of see, you know, the, the Red Cross woman in the center with the angel wings or the men love her. But there's also this wolf character following her, um, which was a way that um, a way to characterize sort of overly aggressive um, men. Right. On one hand, serving donuts and jitterbugging with GIs asked women to do, again, what they had always done. Um, and that's a comforting image. Right. But it's very hard balance um, for women like Hazel. Um, who have to manage these men's affections while guarding their own. 
Um, Hazel had to make each man feel as if he was the most important person in the world, as though she wanted to do nothing more than spend every minute of her day with him, to flirt with him, but not too much. And she has to guard her own reputation at all moments and remember how important a woman's reputation was in this era. Um, you know, she said that most of the men interpreted every smile as a come on and eventually tried to smooch. Um, I keep doing air quotes that you all can't see. Um, the, the smooch part is a quote. Um, she said um, she and her, her roommate were always very careful to select men they socialized with in the evenings. Um, she wrote home that even if the men happen to be dull or no fun, they are at least gentlemen, right? And so in many ways, you know, the Red Cross is asking women to fit conventional notions of women's wartime roles, um, though it's taking them far beyond the conventional limitations of women's wartime work or even proper ideas of womanhood, right? The daily rigors of the work prove challenging. Um, and they're enduring harsh conditions of remote theaters. They're driving trucks and Jeeps across war zones. Um, and they're managing all of these men's attentions and affection. Hazel wrote um, to her parents not long after she heard news of the Japanese surrender. She said, I realize more and more that I've seen and felt something that will set me apart from most Americans for the rest of my life and that there will always be deep inside me certain convictions and experiences that will make me impatient of the complacent acceptance of the good things of life, which characterize Americans who've never been away from home. I think every American should have had to serve a year here. We'd never permit another war. Um, of course, that wasn't, uh, didn't bear out, um, but Hazel was very much right in that this kind of wartime work separated women like her from other women of their generation. Um, another of these women is Elizabeth Richardson. And I think I noticed in the audience chat earlier, somebody might have read um, Jim Madison's Slinging Donuts for the Boys, which is about Elizabeth and it's a great book. Um, I think it would be very accessible for high school students. Um, and so I, I definitely encourage everybody to check it out. Um, Elizabeth was 26 when she joined the Red Cross. Um, she was from a little town in Indiana and had attended Downer College in Milwaukee. Um, she was drawing advertisements at a department store in Milwaukee um, when the war broke out. And she and her roommates were volunteering their free time at USO Club um, host, that hosted dances for soldiers. But like most Americans, you know, before the war, Elizabeth thought the U.S. should stay out of it. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor, she wanted to do something more. And dancing at the USO wasn't enough for her. Um, much like Hazel, she wanted to do something more direct and more um, connected to the war. And so she also joined the Red Cross um, in May 1944. Um, all Red Cross women trained at American University in D.C., um, and so she learned, you know, organization and hierarchy of the military. She learned all of the sports so that they could converse with the GIs about their favorite teams. Um, they learned how to break the ice, which was not something that most girls of this class um, knew how to do. Again, it's sort of reversing courtship patterns. Um, they're, they're practicing asking men to dance. Um, they're practicing how to make these men feel as if they're the only men in the universe. Um, and Elizabeth went to uh, work for the Red Cross with the Club Mobile program in particular. Um, she felt personally um, in this work the difficulties of being the men's surrogate sweetheart. Um, she was initially sent to work on a Club Mobile that served the men of the 82nd Airborne um, at their base in Leicester, England. Um, after about a month of fighting in Germany, the 82nd Airborne was brought back to England where Elizabeth and her coworkers served them donuts and tried to take their minds off the war. Um, and essentially in that work, the Red Cross expected that they would serve as grief counselors for war weary men, but they had not been trained to do that work. Um, these were women and most officials assumed that that would be enough, um, but the women knew better. Elizabeth wrote to her parents, if you only knew what combat does to these boys, not in the physical sense, although that's bad enough, but mentally. Um, her job was to boost their morale, but she knew full well that nobody in the war was there to worry about hers. 
um, she was there as a site for their sore eyes, and that's exactly what the Red Cross wanted. But that kind of work was very emotionally draining. Um, the men didn't come for the donuts, as I said earlier. Um, they came to see, as Elizabeth put it, real live American girls who served them. Um, and Elizabeth chalked up all the attention to being a rarity. She wrote one of her friends at home that the attention was not due to my fatal beauty that drives men mad. I'm just a victim of circumstances and non-fraternization. Whatever the case, thousands of men who flock, did flock to see the Club Mobile women on a daily basis. And no matter how exhausting all of that attention became, Elizabeth and all of her coworkers could never tell the men that they just needed some time alone, right? It didn't matter how annoying they might have grown, their goo-goo eyes and their constant request to dance. She could never just tell them to go away, right? It was her job to make them feel welcome and comforted. Never, ever say, I just need some time to myself. Um, but no matter how much they tried to keep their distance from these men, they still developed close relationships with them, um, and sometimes even a little bit more than that. Um, Elizabeth grew close to a nice second lieutenant from Yonkers named Larry, and she wrote to her parents that under happier circumstances and better years, I can imagine nothing better than burning the toast for him. Apparently, she wasn't as good a cook as she might have been. Um, but she knew that wartime romances didn't always have happy endings. And so she and Larry said their goodbyes on the eve of his departure for Germany. Um, she said that nothing over here is permanent. Nothing is sure, not even tomorrow's mail. So in April of 45, she also went to the continent. And when she did, she received news that Larry had been missing since the Battle of the Bulge. But in a reversal of the more common wartime story, Larry survived the war and Elizabeth did not. Um, it was against Red Cross regulations, but many women often hitched rides with pilots when they needed to travel. And on the morning of July 25th, 1945, Elizabeth got in a two-seater plane en route to Paris where she had a meeting. Shortly after taking off, the plane crashed in a heavy fog and she and the pilot were killed instantly. She was 27 years old. Her co-workers organized a funeral for her, and she was originally buried in a military cemetery near Evreux, France. And then three years later, her parents made the decision to leave her remains with the men she had served. And she's one of four women buried, four American women buried at the American Cemetery at Normandy, um, and was one of 72 Red Cross women who died in the war. So when most Americans think of these women, if they do at all, Right. If we even think of these women, I suspect that we do so through rose colored glasses, right, in a nostalgic way um, that women who serve donuts, that they who dance on stage, they fit this sort of rosy colored image of the war. They fit the myth of everybody doing their part happily, everybody sacrificing for the war effort, coming together, overcoming their differences. But what I like to do is think a little bit about how, why we like these images so much, um, what purpose they served in the war and why we like them today, right? Even though we have information on how all of this work puts women in untenable situations, um, even though we have more nuanced understandings of the ways that women were sexualized in the war, that image of women as reward or women as home, women as um, victory in many ways, um, that still holds. And I think it's important and significant that one of our most lasting images of the war is, of course, the one at the end of victory, but also one that represents victory in a particular way, right? And there was a lot of discussion about this photograph in particular in the wake of the Me Too movement, um, and critics would say, that we're imposing the values of today on the past. Um, but if you look at the history of this photograph and what happened um, on that day, you know, the people in the photograph um, certainly weren't the only couple to have kissed on VJ Day, um, not by a long shot. Um, but the, the photograph um, continues to ignore the cost for women. Um, and in this case, uh, if you look at or Greta Friedman, uh, the woman, uh, the dental assistant, not a nurse, but dental 
dental assistant in the photograph um, said from the beginning that this was not a consensual thing. Um, George Mendoza, in the, the man in the photograph, was actually on a date with the woman who became his wife, and that's not the woman he kissed. Um, he said he kissed this woman because he thought she was a nurse. Um, and so it, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, certainly a lot more there than gets captured, um, I think, in the public mind um, for the most part. And that, I think it's not a bad thing that these kinds of programs came to an end, right? And using women as symbols of the family for which men fought and to which they hope to return, military, the military and civilian organizations associate women with the home front even when they went to war, even when they're in a war zone. Programs that employed women to serve hot chocolate and donuts position them as servicemen's supporters, not their equals. And holding women up as symbols of both wholesome and sexualized ideals, we place women in untenable and often dangerous situations. And recreation and entertainment programs that offer women as antidotes to the military suggest they had no place in it. But I think also we might learn something from women like Gretchen and Hazel and Elizabeth who can teach us something about the importance of offering a warm smile or a sympathetic ear, about reminding those who served um, that they were remembered and appreciated. Um, and so with that, I would be happy to take some more questions and see, see what you all think. Yeah, it's such a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you for walking us through that narrative, uh, Professor Viewer. We do have uh, quite a few questions that have Speed up, so I'm going to use the remaining time, about 10 minutes, to bring this to you. Um, uh, let's see. Let's do them in this order. Um, talk to us some about whether or not women who participated in the ways that you've described. This question is from Carolyn, and I'm going to reframe it a little bit. So, Carolyn, you nudge me if I'm if I uh, get this wrong. Um, tell, talk to us a little bit about the benefits that they might have received as the men and, and the, the male soldiers did. So um, were, was there any kind of post-service benefits that women received for their service? None at all. Um, they were not considered veterans in any sense. Um, you know, in any formal sense, there's no GI Bill for them. Um, there's no transition, you know, transitionary um, help um, back into the civilian workforce at home. There's none of that. Um, I think, you know, I, I quoted Hazel saying how this would separate her um, in her generation. And for women in particular, I think that separation is more profound than than even the separation of men who had served in the war um, and those who hadn't, right? You've got women who are coming home from a war zone. Um, you know, and if you try to explain what you did, right, what do you say? I served coffee and I served donuts, right? Or I danced for the troops. Um, it's, a, it's a hard thing to explain to the public. Um, and so for a lot of these women, they've really experienced a world that very few women of their generation did. They've experienced a war uh, in ways that a lot of men didn't, frankly, right? And so for a lot of these women who come home, it's just a harder harder transition back. Um, and so there's, there's nothing formal that recognizes their service um, that might've made that a bit easier. Mm, thank you. Yeah. This question comes from Sylvia. Sylvia is in Los Angeles and wonders if there's a memorial somewhere for these women who gave up so much to serve their country. Um, and then uh, a second follow-up question, do you think that women pilots will ever be given recognition they deserve? Yeah, another good question. So with the women pilots, with the WASP, which I, I think that's what uh, what you mean, Sylvia, with the WASP, they actually fought for years to get veteran status uh, because the WASP were officially civilians hired by the military. They weren't they weren't at the time um, enlisted into the military proper. Um, and so they fought for benefits later and got them. Um, there are some memorials in like there's one in um, in Washington D.C. at the Red Cross headquarters for Red Cross women who have died in war. Um, 
any kind of memorialization has been more on the local scene or a smaller kind of effort. Um, the, I guess the, the biggest memorial that would in, incorporate this kind of work would be the Vietnam Women's Memorial, though it's for a later, a later war. Um, and that memorial is dedicated to all women, um, who, American women who served in Vietnam. And so it is intended to include Red Cross women um, but that's the that would be the most formal kind of memorial that I can think of off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Um, this question comes from Allison, who is at Santa Rosa Junior College. Uh, Allison wonders if there's any research on what led women to volunteer to be a part of the Red Cross or USO. It it seems to, to Allison that it would uh, not be an easy situation to travel to these military fronts. Um, demographically, who who were these women? Right, most of the women are um, college educated. They are sort of middle class white women who want to do something for the war. They're not content to sit at home and, uh, you know, go volunteer at the local USO club in the town. They really want to do something directly involved in the war. Um, and so they're kind of adventurous. You know, they've got a bit of a spark to them, you know, folks might have said at the time. Um, and but they also, you know, their class status is important in the sense that if you're really, you know, if your family is dependent on your on your income, this isn't the kind of work you're probably going to do. Right. You're going to get paid to do this work, but it's not enough to to live on if your family really needs it. And so they're predominantly middle class white women who can afford to do this kind of work in all kinds of ways. Thank you. Um, Sylvia, again, has a, uh, another question. Sylvia is wondering if there's any record of women having PTSD from this era. Oh, if there's a record, no. Uh, <laughs> would we suspect that some of them did? Probably so. Um, in, the le in the very least, it seems common to me that a lot of them would have um, would have had a hard time sort of explaining their work and finding women of their of their generation um, who they, with whom they could talk about it. Um, you know, their their experiences were just so different than so many other women of that time. But as far as official record of that, no, no. I mean, and part of that is related to the fact that they are civilians, um, you know, and that they're they're going back. Um, into their communities and they're out of that kind of work um, as soon as they get home, basically. And so they're they're sort of they're they're dispersed across the country. Um, yeah, yeah. That's I mean that's a really good question too. Officially, no. <laughs> Unofficially, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> of course. Uh, this mm -hmm. leads to the next question. This one's from Stephanie, who is in New Hampshire. Stephanie wonders if these women formed any clubs to support one another after the war, or may, maybe alternatively, did they remain in touch, or did they form any kind of bond with each other that that transcended their experience in the war? Yeah, I mean, there's some some attempts later to kind of keep in touch. There were um, sort of reunions years later. Some of it um, doesn't occur for many years later, right? These women go home, they sort of move back into their lives. For most of them, they get married, they have families. And so some of some of the reunion and kind of keeping in touch occurs later once their children are older. Um, but there were different, there was a, uh, I forget exactly what they called themselves, but there was a group um, that was organized out of DC that tried to keep people in touch um, and keep them um, kind of gathering. The later generations of these women do this work or do that same kind of um, reunion um, later, but with the World War II generation, there's there's some of it. Got it. Thank you. Um, this question comes from uh, Bernie. Bernie's in Vermont, <laughs> uh, oddly enough. Um, Bernie's wondering if there are examples of other countries doing something similar during World War II. Similar, though not um, exactly the same. Um, and part of the biggest part of that of the why not is that Americans um, 
I mean, if you think about it, Americans fight on other people's lands. <laughs> uh, Americans take their wars to other continents. And so if you were a British soldier and you got leave, you might have got to go home. Um, if you were, you know, any other example. Um, but for Americans, they're not going home. And so part of the reason why we send our entertainment to them is that they are in the war for the duration. Um, the Brits do send around some entertainment, um, but they don't set up the same kind of um, clubs or that kind of thing that Americans uh, do for their soldiers. Last question uh, comes from me, Kara. I started with a question. I'm going to uh, provide the, the, the bookend question, the last question. You've got a room full of educators. Um, they work with students at all ages. From your point of view, what are some of your big takeaways from tonight? What would you really like them to remember and be sure to at least keep in mind when they approach the role of women in 20th century war? Oh, brother, that's a big one, Andy. Um, <laughs> um, I think with this topic in particular, what I come away from it is that this kind of work on the surface of it is um, or could be cast as fairly simplistic, that the, the Americans are sending these women to help the boys at the front. It fits with what everybody thinks women are supposed to be. There's nothing complicated about it. Um, what I think is important is to look at this kind of work from the women's perspective and to see how very difficult it was um, and how sort of how much it took from them to do this kind of work. I think it's also important um, to show how women can use and did use in this case something that that didn't overtly break anybody's ideals of what you know, middle-class white women were supposed to be, right? This work looks like what most people think women do in war, but individual women use it for their own purposes, right? They use it to have a wartime experience, to get as close to the war as they can, for adventure, for all of the, the many, 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 many reasons people go to war and sign up for service, um, that they're using it for their own purposes, not just what what it is intended to be. Um, and so I think if if students can put themselves in these women's shoes, then they'll see some more complexity to that kind of experience um, in all kinds of ways. And that, I think, gets us closer to what these women experience than just looking at, you know, how it might be depicted um, on film or in these World War II era films about um, entertaining the boys. Professor Viewick, thank you again so much for sharing this narrative with us tonight. Um, thank you for your good work, and we appreciate you spending the evening with us. No, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming, for all these comments on this side. I'm trying to pay attention. You guys are typing so fast. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you in the audience who are interested in World War II, please do visit the Humanities in Class webinar series and type in uh, some keywords, keywords like women and war or World War II. You might just find this Rewind uh, webinar from December 7th, 2017. I was joined by Will Hitchcock from the University of Virginia to speak about the price of liberation in World War II. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, it's a big day, election day, um, but it's also a school day. And I know that you've got a lot going on in preparation for tomorrow. Please do uh, be sure to join the email listserv for the National Humanities Center and check out uh, our website for upcoming opportunities and activities. That does include our next webinar. This is scheduled for November 15th next week. I'll be joined by two speakers, actually. Uh, Christina uh, Stanchel from Virginia Commonwealth University and Brenda Child from the University of Minnesota will join us to discuss Indian boarding schools in the 19th and 20th centuries. I hope you do have a chance to join us then. Have a great day at school tomorrow. Uh, join us next time for the Humanities of Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. Mm -hmm.